May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When you listen to this morning's gospel, how did you picture the women moving through the streets? Were they moving quickly? Were the streets darkened and quiet as they made their way to the site of Jesus' tomb? Certainly, their pace was quick and with purposeful intent. But the streets, they were neither quiet nor dark. It was the first day of the working week, and along with the women, merchants and laborers, waiting and anticipating the first red rim of the rising sun to indicate the end of the Sabbath, were in the streets. At the break of dawn, the clamor of commerce was ringing throughout them. Jerusalem was not silent. The focus of the day was on the work in the week ahead rather than on the tragic event of the preceding Friday. Like the men and women in the streets of Jerusalem, our own working lives is a stone rolled against our spiritual awakenings and our spiritual longings. We only identify with the women's sad journey when our own daily routine is interrupted by tragedy and sorrow. Then, as with the women, it seems incomprehensible to us that daily life is indifferent to our pain and our grief as it carries on unfeelingly and unchanged. One of the biggest impediments guarding the stone against our spirit, our soul's solace, is historical memory. Jesus is a figure of the past for us. And being such, resurrected or not, we find it difficult to find in him a relevant contemporary. Our hope is securely entombed in the past and in ancient story. If our celebration today of a risen Lord is to be more than a remembrance day, if Easter is to have immediate relevance to our own spiritual journeys, if the day of resurrection is to be a celebration of the achieved goals of our spiritual longing, then someone has to roll away the stone which bars the entrance to the empty tomb and the reality of a risen, present Lord and Savior for us today. And how is that to be accomplished? We need both an angel and a sharing witness, two saints. I don't suppose the women at the tomb of Jesus had ever seen an angel before. Certainly their reaction was one of alien experience, and I don't intend any fun there. Certainly spiritual encounters are not commonplace for anyone. Yet they do happen. And when they do, they convey assurance to the faith of those who have experienced them that God 
is indeed alive. But these experiences have been given to them not just for themselves, but for others as well. The angels at the tomb and the risen Christ in his first appearances said that the story of their encounter must be shared with others. That's why the women returned to tell the apostles what had happened to them. When I was in my second year of theology at, at, here in college, my roommate and I one evening decided to share the stories, our own stories, of our encounter with God that led us to where we were that day. Both stories were different, both in content and context. But we all loved drama. My story was not as dramatic as my son's, as my uh, roommate's films. So I'm going to tell you his story. We really love drama. Phil was an employee at the Fasco Steel in Hamilton. And one night, he was uh, driving a jitney in one of the Fasco's warehouses. He was alone. And Phil's life at that time was very lonely. He was depressed. His life didn't seem to have a focus. He didn't know what he was going to be doing or where he was going. And in his utter despair, he suddenly cried out, God, if you're really there, show yourself and help me. And suddenly, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. And Phil was literally blown off his jitney. And then, lying on the cold floor, suddenly felt touched and a peace went through him entirely. A peace that a settlement that he had never experienced before. And then as he recovered himself, he heard the pounding rain on the steel roof above him. My story was a little bit more protracted and gentle than that. The context being different. But for both of us, in hearing each other's stories, it brought up biblical antecedents, which were important to us, but which were scripture, and which had taken place in the past. They weren't present realities. And on myself, on hearing Phil's story, it brought to mind Elijah's con uh, being confronted by God while he was taking refuge in a cave on Mount Horeb, where he had fled to escape Jezebel's and Ahab's wrath after the great contest on Mount Carmel. Elijah was my favorite prophet. And it also brought to mind, to me, that great wind which literally blew the apostles out of their own hiding place on the day of Pentecost and brought them into the marketplace to declare the wonders of a risen God that Jesus had risen from the dead, that he was alive, and that he loved them, regardless of what it was that they had done.
both of us, after exchanging our stories, noticed tears coming down each other's faces. They weren't tears of sorrow, they weren't tears of joy, they were tears of awe of how we had experienced a God who was alive and a God who cared. The journey to Easter joy is not just that of listening to mere information about Jesus as contained in the scriptures or in public worship. It's the sharing of personal religious experience with other members of the Christian community. And that's not solely the responsibility of, of professional Christians like myself and the clergy monks and nuns, but of each one of us. To say that we are Christian apart from Christian fellowship is an oxymoron, as an isolated coal cannot continue to glow apart from the fire in the heart. Neither can our faith be sustained apart from the fellowship of the Christian community. God has promised that where two or three are gathered together in his name, sharing their stories, celebrating a risen Christ, there he stands amongst us. Amen. Amen.